Welcome to another edition of the Naval History Podcast on the Proceedings Podcast channel. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine, and I'm glad you could join us on this special day. It's 7 June, 2022. 80 years ago to the day, on this very date, one of the greatest naval battles in American history, world history, World War II history, however you want to cut it, came to a conclusion. I speak, of course, of the Battle of Midway. And we are thrilled in the current issue of Naval History Magazine to have as our cover story a beautiful summation of this epochal battle by well-known and acclaimed Midway authority, Jonathan Parshall, co-author of the modern day classic, Shattered Sword. Um, if you haven't read it, then you've missed out on some of the most important uh, new literature on this battle and a generation. Um, Jonathan, Welcome aboard. We're glad to have you on this special uh, day where we commemorate the Battle of Midway. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. I can't think of anyone uh, to share it with uh, that would be better. Um, this article you did for us is um, uh, it's, it's consummate, and I recommend it to those of you who haven't read it yet. Um, it not only provides a really great um, operational overview, it's a nice refresher, and it also shows, and I think even importantly, the real crux of the article is how our understanding of Midway has never stopped changing. Uh, the conventional wisdom, the only thing constant about the conventional wisdom has been its change. So why don't we just kick it right off, John? Why don't you uh, let's start with a, a nice sort of, for the, the viewers, a, um, sort of a rehash of the battle, a blow by blow to kind of get them back caught up to speed on what happened there. Then we'll look at how what we know about it has sure. changed over time. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. And I'll, I'll try to keep this as brief as possible. Uh, basically, the, the basic operation that, that Admiral Yamamoto, who's commander in chief of the Pacific uh, or combined fleet is looking to do is try to draw the American carriers out of Pearl Harbor and destroy them. Uh, reasoning that, that the American carriers at this point, there's only about three of them left, are basically the sole remaining important naval assets uh, that the Americans have left in this war, and that if he can destroy them, he can hopefully bring the Americans to the bargaining table sometime in 1942 and end this war. Um, unfortunately, uh, for Yamamoto, what he doesn't know is that the Americans have broken Japan's operational code, 20, uh, JN-25B. And that gives Admiral Nimitz, who's the commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet, bare time to scrape up the assets necessary to offer battle uh, around Midway. Uh, and he gets three of his own aircraft carriers up there by hook or by crook, uh, the Hornet, the Enterprise, and the Yorktown. And on 4 June, battle is joined. Uh, the Japanese bring four aircraft carriers, Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, and Hiryu, to the battle. And they attack the island of Midway. Uh, there's a lot of back and forth during the morning, uh, a lot of fairly uh, ineffective airstrikes on the part of the Americans uh, flying out from Midway Island trying to attack the Japanese, not very successfully. Uh, and the Americans likewise uh, detect the Japanese first. Uh, we get our carrier strikes in against the Japanese first, but they too are not very effective with a number of torpedo plane squadrons going to their doom uh, around 0920 in the morning. And then finally, um, again, by purest luck, two separate groups of dive bombers from the American carriers catch the Japanese carrier force at about 1020 in the morning, deliver a uh, decisive strike against that carrier force, knock out three of the aircraft carriers. There are additional counterattacks during the afternoon. Uh, Yorktown is, is very heavily damaged and put out of business. The sole remaining carrier on the Japanese side, the Hiryu, is bombed around supper time and likewise set ablaze. Uh, Yorktown will be picked off on June 7th, 80 years ago today, uh, and we will end up losing her. But the final Blow by blow is the Japanese lose four aircraft carriers uh, and 3,000 sailors, about 250 aircraft. Uh, the Americans lose one aircraft carrier, the Yorktown, about 260 personnel and around 100 some aircraft. So it's a very decisive victory uh, for the Americans. I'll say, and it's 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 amazing how so much of history can hinge on those few minutes um, of one battle and. Uh, you know, the Jap you look at the map of the Japanese going into this and uh, all the, uh, you know, they it it was the opposite of what they had expected. Um, and 
losing three out of their four carriers in one fell swoop like that in a matter of like I think it was seven minutes. Um, yeah. It's like the war was altered in those seven minutes, not just this battle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's it's just it's a phenomenal um, and, and for America in spring of forty two, uh, this was like manna from heaven. Uh, yeah, it was just such a stunning turnaround of how fortunes had been. Um, I think it was easy to see why uh, this was embraced from the get go, as you point out in your article by. The official Navy write up in 1948 is already calling it the most important naval battle in history, world right. history. One of the most important. Yeah. One, yeah. Um, but one of the early things that arises out of that elation, as you talk about, is this sense that, uh, you know, we were the underdog. I think we generally felt like the underdog after Pearl Harbor. And, you know, it's been a rough spring, right? Um, yeah. You know, you've got the u-boats on the east coast uh pacific right. is happening and so yeah, this is like the right thing. go ahead I'm sorry. i was just going to say I, I think it's difficult for the for the modern uh listener to really sort of put ourselves back where the american populace was and, and frankly where all of uh the western allies were collectively uh 80 years ago that uh, the war was just going disastrously, not only for the Americans, but also for the British and the Russians. Um, <clears throat> things were not looking good for the Allies at this point of time. This, this was a very dark, dark run. And so the, the morale effect of being able to sort of claw our way back to parity in terms of carriers in the Pacific in June of 42, you know, it wasn't I don't know that it was necessarily viewed at the time as being, okay, you know, this is a turning point in the, in the entire war, but it's certainly, you know, there's a, a collective exhalation of, okay, you know, a little bit of the pressure is off here in the Pacific. Right, right. And um, I think from that elation that originally accrued to the victory, it's easy to see how the historiography of it early on is how we came from we were the underdogs and we we whooped them in this important engagement and uh, a lot of the famous books on it as you point out have have titles that infer this incredible victory miracle at midway and but with that there creeps into the story some uh, uh unintentionally pernicious myths about what really happened so maybe you can tell us how our true understanding of what really happened there has <laughs> changed decade by decade right and and let me just step back and say, you know, we can call this a true understanding, but I, I fully expect that the understanding that we have here in 2022, you know, if we were to forward project another 20, 30, 40 years, it's going to be different then as well. Um, I think when you when the, the, the smoke first clears on the battle, so you start looking at the historiography, even in the in the 40s and 50s. Uh, there was a, an inflated sense as to how well uh, the U.S. Army Air Forces had done uh, during the battle. They had claimed that their B-17s had sunk a couple of the aircraft carriers, and that was held to be true up until we started interviewing surviving Japanese officers uh, after the war, and they pointed out that, no, you know, the B-17s never landed a single bomb on us. Um, so that was a, a shift. Uh, and, of course, you have to keep in mind that uh, nobody knew about the code breaking uh, in the public. So that was a piece of information which was not revealed, you know, until well down the line, until you get to the late 1960s. And so a lot of the contemporary authors, uh, people like Samuel Elliott Morrison, who are writing the official Navy histories, you know, even if he knew about the code breaking, and I don't know if he did or not, He's not allowed to talk about that. I don't think he did know about the code breaking. So that whole aspect of the battle is just completely hidden in the shadows. There is this sense uh, within the American accounts, and you see this all the way up to Incredible Victory and Miracle of Midway, which is published in the 80s, that the Americans had prevailed against incredibly overpowering odds uh, during this battle. And it is absolutely true that at this point in time, the American Navy was uh, numerically inferior to the Japanese fleet in toto. And if you look at the number of Japanese ships that are running around in the Pacific somewhere, you know, either up in the Aleutians or following along behind the carrier force, you know, invasion forces, battleship support forces, yada, 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 
yes, the Japanese did seriously outnumber the Americans that morning. But if you look at the forces that are actually at the tip of the spear and fought off Midway, what you see is that the Japanese brought 20 warships, four aircraft carriers, 248 carrier aircraft to face three American carriers, an unsinkable island airfield, 368 aircraft. Um, so, you know, it was a much closer run thing at the point of the spear uh, than a lot of those uh, immediate post-war accounts come out to be. Right. Um, even if you um, subtract the um, Army Air Force uh, aircraft that were um, at Midway Island from the equation, we still had a um, greater advantage in force, I would, I would think. You know? Yeah, just, just the aircraft that we had alone on uh, the aircraft carriers was, was equivalent to what mm -hmm. Nagumo had on his carriers. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we do own Midway Atoll and are able to use a large number of Catalina scouting planes uh, from, from that atoll, you know, scouting aircraft don't get a lot of the, the glamour factor but it's incredibly important to be able to detect your enemy before he detects you and therefore attack effectively first. So uh, that advantage in scouting assets was critical to the outcome of the battle. As a quick aside, we're talking about Midway Atoll. Uh, I've always found it really kind of neat that the uh, film director, John Ford, was at Midway and he got some phenomenal footage of the bombing going on and anti-aircraft action going on. And I think he might have uh, gotten a little slight wound, shrapnel wound or something himself, but he was right out there in the thick of it with his yeah. camera rolling. Yeah. And that's a real treasure of, a, um, of an archive that film footage that uh, the, we think of him as more as a Western director, but uh, he loved the Navy and uh, he was there. Yeah, no, good point. I mean, uh, and, and given the fact that, you know, to this point in the war, the Japanese have reeled off an unbroken string of victories you know, if you're being sent out to um, to an island like Midway and are being told that there may be some action here, you know, someone pointed this out to me in a in a recent podcast um, as well. You know, that's that's kind of a, a gutsy assignment to to want to take. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you end up in a concentration camp. You know, look mm -hmm. at what happened at Wake Island just a few months previous. You know, that entire garrison gets captured. Um, so, so far as John Ford knew, you know, he's, he's potentially heading into a very dangerous, uh, assignment here. And yes, during the bombing attack, uh, that the Japanese launched during the morning, he's out there with his camera in an exposed position. There are people saying, you know, come on, get in the bunker. And he's like, no, I got to get this. So yeah, a, a, a consummate professional and a, and a very brave individual. Mm-hmm. He became, a, I think, a rear admiral in Naval Reserve, which he was extremely proud of. A lot of people don't realize he tried to get in the Naval Academy. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Hollywood became his path instead, but he, okay. got, he was in Midway. Yeah. Think of it. Well, yeah. that's aggression. But let's get back to the, um, the, story of, the story of Midway and how it's changed over time. So not knowing about the code breakers, that's a huge factor, right? I mean, yeah. we, we kind of had their number more than they knew. And... Uh, yeah, and that actually leads to sort of the, I would guess, what I would call kind of the intermediate period of the interpretation of Midway, which is, okay, when when the news comes out that, by the way, we've broken their operational code, then a lot of the accounts sort of aired towards uh, this notion of, well, you know, the battle was over before it even began. I mean, we were reading their mail, right? How could they possibly win a battle like that? Nowadays, I think that there's there's a pushback on that tenet of thinking in that there's a there's a better understanding of just how difficult it is to translate strategic level intelligence into actionable tactical level results. And I'll give you an analog um, during this very same time in the war, the British were developing wonderful intelligence on uh, the German operations in North Africa uh, against Rommel. Uh, Enigma was yielding up all sorts of secrets uh, that were being transmitted in some cases near real time to 8th Army uh, in North Africa as they were going into battles like Gazala, which happens at the end of May 1942. 
Did the British win those battles? No, they did not. And the reason they didn't is because their combined arms doctrine was garbage, and Eighth Army was just incapable of taking on the Africa Corps at a tactical level. They just hadn't gotten their act together well enough to make it happen. So, you know, the same thing is certainly true of naval warfare, that um, just because the Americans are reading enough of Japan's mail to know that there's going to be an operation that's going to happen off of Midway at approximately this date does not necessarily mean that our carrier air groups are going to be proficient enough to get the job done against the Japanese. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the first things. And that doesn't come out to the late 60s. Um, right. I'm trying to think of some other uh, really good examples you give of how this changes, because it really does evolve through the decades. Um, what was the, f the real earliest? Well, I mean, I'm sure there were a spate of them. Um, but Walter Lord's... Um, Midway book was like is that early sixties I believe yeah, late sixties yeah. yeah like I want to say nineteen sixty seven yeah uh, okay uh, as you point out um, that's a beautifully written book oh. um, is it, when, when we're talking about how a lot of the information in these earlier accounts we now know more about right there's still a value as literature if you will as historical literature read I mean Walter Lord would be a good example would you not absolutely. agree I mean that's still a beautiful book to read and absolutely um, buy him on it it's just it's like it's no I, so I would yeah I would never poo poo uh, that book at all it's incredibly well written it still stands up very well in terms of its uh, what do I want to say character portrayals um, certainly it, it gets some details wrong. Uh, regarding what was going on in the Japanese flight techs at the time of that dive bomber attack. And we're, we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. Um, but the other thing I'll say about Walter Lord is that he was an incredibly generous individual that uh, when Tony and I were working on our book, we reached out to him because we wanted to get some of the interview notes that he had for uh, his um, officer interviews. And he was amazing to us, uh, even though at that time he was very sick with Parkinson's. He told his personal secretary, you know, give these guys basically everything that you can. And his assistance was invaluable. So, yeah, if, if you were talking to me and saying, you know, John, what are the top five books on the Battle of Midway? Um that I would, you know, that you would recommend people go read, I would still put Walter Lord's book on that list, even though it's been superseded in some of its details. I think it's really um, wonderful you got to interact with him. I mean, he's kind yeah. of a legend. He wrote the um, the really famous account of the Titanic that was the definitive for the longest time. Right. Uh, Night to Remember. Um, yep. Numerous other books as well. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned um, uh, Miracle at, Whit at Midway. That's another uh, one that stands the test of time in terms of uh, classic of naval literature, if you will, even though we've gotten beyond and we've gotten beyond in terms of what we know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Prang's work, uh, that's sort of an interesting behind the scenes story, too, and that um, Prang ends up dying from from cancer before that book gets published and so he turns over his working notes to his two graduate students uh donald goldstein and katherine Dillon, and basically says you know this is my legacy make this happen um <laughs> i'll be honest don goldstein and i did not get along well from a personal standpoint um we talk about the generosity of a walter lord donald was not necessarily as forthcoming with with uh some of his interview notes from the prang collection as he might have been um and also to be honest I, he just he felt that that tony and our book was sort of a challenge to his book in terms of legacy and he didn't like that so that, that's unfortunate you know welcome to Welcome to scholarship. Um, I still think that his book is a very important contribution to the battle. It's a very big contribution. It's got a lot of good stuff in there. Um, but the, the nub of the matter for us from an interpretational standpoint is what was going on on the Japanese flight decks at 1020. And, and that really is the big clarification that our book brings into the mix. Up to this point, and actually let me wind this back because 
the, the real problem with a lot of the, uh, the Western accounts was that they had very few Japanese sources to work from. There's really only three that had been translated into English, and they were uh, the battle report of Admiral Nagumo, called the Nagumo Report, which was captured practically on his dead body on the island of Saipan in 1944 and was translated uh, by Office of Naval Intelligence in 47. So we got that in English. Um, we have that set of interviews uh, done by the Strategic Bombing Survey immediately after the war that interviewed people like Mitsuo Fuchida and uh, Minoru Genda and, and folks like that on the battle. And then finally, you have Mitsuo Fuchida's book, uh, Midway, The Battle That Doomed Japan, which came out in Japan in the, the mid 19, early to mid 1950s. Um, and was incredibly influential because here you've got this guy, uh, Fuchida, who was Akagi's air group commander. He was on the bridge of Akagi the entire morning during Midway. I mean, if this guy, you know, you couldn't ask for a better ringside seat. And, and so he was it. Um, the problem is that Fuchida had a number of ulterior agendas and he ends up introducing, intentionally introducing falsehoods into the account. And one of the biggest falsehoods is that at 1020 in the morning, you know, we've finally gotten our aircraft rearmed and re-equipped and they're all up on the flight deck and everything is just about ready to go. So we're just minutes away from launching this knockout blow against the Americans and oh my God, here come the dive bombers and it's over. So that myth has carried forward to the point where, you know, Tony and I published our book and demonstrated that it was impossible for the Japanese to have had uh, their force up on the flight decks. And in fact, those flight decks were chewed up with combat air patrol operations the entire morning. Uh, and that all of those counterattack planes were still down in the hangars at the time of, of the American dive bomber attack. And the Japanese were nowhere near ready to launch their counterstrike. So that takes us to what I would say would be the kind of the third phase of reinterpretation, which kind of starts with Tony and my book. Wow. It's one thing when uh, we don't know yet, but to deliberately inject some wrong history into the historical record that's going to get picked up and repeated over and over until it becomes part of the conventional wisdom. Yeah. That, um, that's uh, not good. Not so. good. Well, and, and Fuchida, honestly, for all that he impacted the history of Midway, his impact on Pearl Harbor is equally pernicious, if not more so. Mm -hmm. So we've all grown up uh, watching Tora, 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 right? You know, I don't know how many times I've seen that movie, and it too stands up very well. Mm -hmm. But this end sequence where Fuchida lands back on the flight deck of, a deck of Akagi and says, you know, why isn't a third strike wave? Where's Where are the planes? Why aren't we getting ready to go? Um and he looks up at, at the bridge of Akagi and his buddy Genda looks down at him. And then there's this debate between Genda and Nagumo on the bridge of Akagi. You know, we've got to go back, got to hit the Americans again. And we've got to knock out their fuel tanks and their, you know, supply depots and that stuff. All of that stuff is completely made up. That mm -hmm. interaction on the bridge of Akagi never occurred. Okay. Mm -hmm. so this whole fuel tank third strike myth that too was the gift to us from fuchida mm -hmm. yeah we've covered some of fuchida's um sort of uh embellishments about pearl harbor in the magazine uh yeah. i would refer uh readers to uh fuchida's decision i forget the, the full name of it um by alan zim yes the year one year uh really kind of ripped the lid off how <laughs> wrong a lot of this stuff yeah. that had crept into the record early yeah, Tora Tora Tora. Yeah, I love that movie. It holds great up. movie. There's some made up stuff in there, but it brings us to a question from a viewer. Uh, yeah, and that's about the recent Midway movie. Yeah. Um, and I I haven't asked you this. I don't know either. What are your thoughts about that movie? I've heard. Right. Yeah. Well. Okay. So I I was hired as a consultant for that movie. Oh. Uh, yeah, late late in the uh, in the process, and I'll be honest, they had me doing dumb stuff uh they I, I was like you know don't you want me to check your fact check your script you know you, you hired a guy who kind of wrote a book on the battle of midway you know 
And they were like, no, no, we, we've got that covered. Um, could, you, <laughs> yeah. could you give us some, some line drawings of the Admiral's launches? And what color were the internal bulkheads of their warships painted? I was, oh, come on. Okay, whatever, dudes. Um, okay, so that said, yes, if, if you are a hardcore guns and ammo kind of person, or a rivet turner, I guess I'd call them, you know, who really is, is checking on all of the the actual depictions in this, in this movie. If you were to take a shot for every factual misconception uh, in that movie, you'd, you'd be off to the ER within about 20 minutes. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of glaring errors um, starting with the depiction of the attack on Pearl Harbor, which is somewhat akin to uh, the star Wars uh, Meridian Canyon scene. You know, you got all these ack ack, you know, shooting at you and, you know, whatever that said, um, I feel that Woody Harrelson's depiction of Nimitz was actually pretty credible. Uh, I, and, and, you know, my personal bugaboo again has been this depiction of the flight decks at 1020 during that dive bomber attack. And in this movie, when we fast forward to that point in the attack, lo and behold, there are very few Japanese planes on the Japanese flight decks. And so, you know, in, in my struggle against Fuchida, you know, that that's a win as far as, as I'm concerned. So uh, it's certainly also more watchable than the 1976 film, I think. Which, yeah, yeah, I find that one just like it doesn't do the importance of this battle justice. And they yeah. got all the 70s era battles, the uh, warships in it and just yeah. everything about it. I don't know. That's yeah. Yeah. It at least has that going for it. It's not the 1976 Midway movie. Well, it sounds well, like if you watch it with, well. with, you know, qualified, you know, check some of your accuracy yeah. filters at the door. There's good things to be had there. It's right. nice to know that if they had you as a consultant, they at least got the flight deck thing almost right. You know. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I'll, I'll take that. And you know, honestly, having been involved in a fair number of TV shows at this point, I will say that uh, as an historian. Uh, your job most of the time is just doing damage control. You know, mm -hmm. how can you prevent them from really sticking their foot in their mouths? If, if there's something that's just outrageously stupid, you know, let's try not to do that. But the bottom line is that a movie is a very different medium. You know, you can only introduce so many characters before mm -hmm. the audience starts going, you know, who's this guy, which is why the modern midway movie really only focuses on what is going on on the carrier enterprise during this battle. You know, Hornet might as well not even exist. You know, mm. Fletcher on your tongue, who's that guy? You know, mm. so they, they cut out a lot of the other really important characters just to focus on what's happening on, on the enterprise. Yeah. I mean, they'd have a seven hour movie if they didn't. So, I mean, you have to yeah. kind of give them that, you know, yeah. they have to find a narrative thread and stick with that. But, and it's a lot to you know to fit into one kind of popcorn yeah. experience you know so well okay so i think people can watch that movie with some uh, you know reservations yeah. but there's some good stuff there take it with a grain of salt i was just noticing here on on the the chat that apparently we've got a couple of questions regarding Halsey and i'd love to yes to yes so why don't we pop up the Halsey question pop them out. okay Love Shattered Sword. Would appreciate yeah. Mr. Marshall's take on whether Halsey would have backed up Miles Browning and his plan to pursue the Japanese or, or the backed up the SBP aviators. Okay, so that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, down through the years, there's been this persistent question. Uh, and, and let me add some context here for, for the viewers. The battle is won by the afternoon of June 4th. But there's a question as to whether or not there might be another Japanese carrier still out there, a fifth carrier, if you will. And so uh, Yorktown has been knocked out of action. Admiral Fletcher is basically concerned with trying to, you know, salvage her, which means the tactical command has been turned over to Raymond Spruance, who's got the Enterprise and the Hornet under his wing. And so his big decision for that night is, do I get aggressive and pursue uh, the Japanese off to the west to be in a position the following morning to hit them hard? Or do I, you know, think to myself that maybe the Japanese might come gunning for me tonight with their surface forces, and so I should keep them at arm's length and, and move off to the east? And in the event... Um, he ends up taking the more cautious approach, which turns out to be the right approach because the Japanese were coming and gunning for him. 
So then the question becomes, well, what would have happened if Halsey had been in the battle? Um, would he have been more aggressive uh, and tried to pursue the Japanese or not? And uh, that is a really fascinating question. Um, I, a lot of people have said that he probably would have tried to pursue them and he might have been, ended up then under the guns of the Japanese late at night. There's another sort of counter counterfactual to that, though, which is to say that if Halsey had been in charge of the battle during the morning, um, there's this incident where the Hornet sends her air group off on the infamous flight to nowhere. Hornet does essentially nothing during the, the whole battle during the fourth, except squander her air group. And that seems to be the result of her skipper, Mitcher, uh, who was a carrier guy and didn't particularly like taking uh, orders from either Spruance or Fletcher, who both were not carrier guys, um, doing his own thing. Well, what if Halsey had been in charge? You know, I personally think that if Halsey had been in charge, uh, he would have yanked Mitcher's chain and said, no, you're going to send the aircraft where I want you to send them, which is in the same general direction that Enterprise and Yorktown are, in which case they might have all encountered the Japanese at a beginning around 0920 and knock the entire carrier force out by lunchtime. So then, you know, you don't have to worry about a follow-up strike or a nighttime engagement because the battle's already done. So I, I don't know. Um, I do think that Halsey, with, with respect to, you know, would he have backed up his aviators versus his chief of staff, Miles Browning, I think that had he been confronted with uh, technical information by his aviators that uh, the follow-up strikes the next day uh, were too far out of range. I think that Halsey was enough of an intellectually honest guy to side with the aviators in the same way that Raymond Spruance did. I love a good contrafactual. So uh, thank you for that question. And uh, thank you for the shout out to uh, Shattered Sword. Um, we have actually another question. Let's do it while we're at it. Um, okay, this one kind of ties in with the first one in a sense. Uh, it's a very intriguing question. Um, do you think uh, Midway's early histories influence popular culture? Example, the original Star Wars, A New Hope, and the Death Star attack as heavily inspired by World War II dogfights. That's a fascinating question. Um, thank I, you, Robert Elliott. Yeah, thank you, Robert Elliott. Um, and I don't know enough about George Lucas, for instance, you know, where he came from as a kid. Because it, it really does kind of wind back to that, right? You know, what, what did you see as a kid that influenced you? You know, uh, when I think back to my own interest in history, it was uh, sparked in large part by my dad, who is a retired college prof. He had an access to reel-to-reel -reel, uh, film projectors, and he started bringing me home um, victory at sea on reel to reel. And, you know, he would, you know, show those episodes, those old TV shows up on the living room wall for me as a first grader, because I was already interested in the Navy. And so victory at sea, you know, influenced me, uh, profoundly to get into this field. So what did George Lucas look at as a kid? I bet you that would explain a lot, uh, around, you know, again, the Canyon scene on the Death Star. I will tell you that I think the reverse is very much true, that I think that uh, Star Wars has, uh, I don't want to say infected, but certainly, uh, <laughs> you know, it has certainly affected movies, much like the, the more recent Midway. Um, if you look at the final battle scene there, where the dive bombers are coming in, uh, through the Japanese formation, and for some reason, well, there's there's torpedo planes too involved in this, but you know they're like skipping over all of these Japanese destroyers on the way in, you know, like uh, seven or eight of them. And first of all, there were only twenty Japanese ships there. You know, if you were lucky, you'd have only managed to you know hopscotch over one of these guys on your way in. But the whole time, of course, you know, the Japanese are just putting up this phenomenal volume of anti-aircraft fire, which is whizzing past the windscreen and all that stuff. And so uh, the, the military history crowd, uh, myself included, kind of jokes about the Star Wars effect that modern movies are expected to have these scenes where 
if you're in an airplane, by God, you're going to be flying through some hellacious flack at some point in this movie because that's what Star Wars has given us. Right. So the Death Star attack, in that sense, has been an influence on uh, Midway cinema. <laughs> For sure. And every other cinema, too. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Lucas was a boomer, so he very well could have watched uh, Victory at Sea when it yeah. came on TV in the 50s. And uh -huh. Oh, that show influenced so many people. I mean, to watch it this day, the opening strains of that music oh. and the uh, the yes. stentorian voice that narrator. It's yeah. like I could it's watch it right stuff. now. You know, yeah, it's still good stuff. I mean, you know, uh, again, it's been superseded in a lot of cases, but from the standpoint of getting people interested in the topic and really presenting it in a dramatic fashion, huh, what's yeah. not to like? Yeah, everybody, if you haven't watched it in a while, the whole thing is out there. You should watch it all over again. It's yeah, really I've got them on I got them on Blu-ray. You know? yeah, 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 I hear you. I'm with yeah. you. Yeah, I might watch that after this. Um yeah. anyway, uh okay, that's it for the questions. Thanks, folks. If there are any more, we'll be here. Yeah, yeah. we'll be here. I love doing doing QA. So yeah. Well, you 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 point out a lot of really interesting ways that our understanding of this battle has evolved, and you also conclude that it continues to evolve. So yeah. What are, can you like pinpoint any areas where you think it would be helpful to know more? You mentioned Japanese records for one. Sure. That's a glaring blank page, maybe. Yeah, um, that is, I think, the, the biggest glaring blank page. And actually, it was interesting for me to sort of look back. You know, Shattered Sword has now been out for 15 years. And uh, we've trolled the notion with with nebraska press of you know let's do a second edition because tony in particular has stayed very much abreast of uh the midway scholarship and has has come to some some interesting new conclusions he's published a couple of articles in the, the naval war college review for instance that looks at um why it was that the japanese scouting pattern was as porous as it was and there's a thing that he discovered that was actually omitted from the official release of the Nagumo report, which is talking about the intelligence estimate that, the, that Admiral Nagumo received prior to the battle, which explicitly said there aren't going to be any American carriers here. And what Tony is able to demonstrate is that if you look at previous scouting patterns during the other operations of Kido Butai, um, hold on a second. Let me turn this off. Go away, telephone. Yours, folks. Um, yeah, we got two phones. My, my wife and I shared the study here. So um, that their their scouting patterns are driven by their intel estimates. And so if you look at their operations in Indian Ocean, for instance, if they get an intel estimate that says that there might be an enemy carrier here, holy cow, they've got, you know, scout planes radiating like the sun. But in the case of Midway, they get an intel estimate that says there's just not going to be anything here. Now you got seven planes up and that's it. So that's a very important insight. And the fact that it was redacted from the Nagumo report, people in Nagumo's staff that survived the war were trying to cover their butts. That's what was going on there. That's the same reason that Fuchida ends up inserting this whole flight deck myth into his book. I look at Fuchida as being sort of the front man of this cabal of surviving first air fleet officers who, you know, if you're coming home after a battle where you lost four aircraft carriers, you know, when you get home to Tokyo, there's going to be a little splaining that has to go on. Right. And so, you know, these guys are really desperately sort of casting around for some sort of a, a story that that seems credible. And it's much better to be able to, to say, oh, you know, we were this close, this close, baby. And then the God's war just came down and snatched it away from us rather than, you know, pointing fingers of blame at themselves for their recon plan or what have you. And if you look at Fuchida's account as well, I mean, it sort of paints Nagumo as being the bad guy, which mm -hmm. is convenient because Nagumo is dead and Yamamoto too, you know, so... Mm -hmm. There's all those sorts of things kind of going on. Um, in terms of things that I would love to see now as a scholar, yeah, the, the Japanese sources that are still out there to be explored, I'm sure, have got all sorts of interesting stuff that we as Western scholars would love to get a hold of. 
um, Senshi Sosho, which is the official uh, Japanese war history series, has never been translated into English except for a couple of the volumes that have to do with the Dutch operations. The Dutch have translated those. Mm -hmm. There's a volume dealing with Kokoda, which the Australians have translated, but the Americans have never bothered translating um, the volumes concerning them because, of course, that would be dozens and dozens and dozens of volumes. So, yeah, do I want the Midway volume translated? You bet I do. And there's also a number of other contemporary Japanese books that, that I would love to get a hold of. Mm -hmm. The good news there is that Machine translation doesn't work so well for Senshi Sosho. It's an old, academic-styled uh, piece of Japanese, and so it's really hard to point things like Google Translate at it and get anything credible out of the pipe. But the more modern Japanese stuff, you know, even, even your phone at this point can make a pretty credible effort mm -hmm. at, at translating modern Japanese. And so... You know, there's starting to be more and more snippets that are that are coming to our attention as a result of that, which is great. Yeah. You mentioned the Nagumo report, which is a vital primary Japanese source we do have. You is there an unredacted version of that available in full or um yeah, if if you're really hardcore about it, what you do is you go and you look at the original Japanese version. Um and it's funny because I think that in terms of the usage of the Japanese sources, the the current version of Shattered Sword that is the most up to date with the scholarship is the Korean version. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, we translated our book into Korean about five years ago, and the translator that we used, uh, that the Korean publisher hired was this guy named Sengun Ri, who is fluent in Korean, obviously, but also fluent in Japanese and could read it. And so he went through all of our footnotes, note by note by note. And in many cases, he would come back to us and say, I don't understand this, guys. You know, you say here that you're quoting the Nagumo report, page 47. But when I go back to the original Japanese version and translate that, it's saying this. And Tony were just like, okay. <laughs> you know? so, so it was great to have him, you know, finding those sorts of sorts of nits. Um, in terms of the other piece of recent scholarship that I'm very proud of, uh, I'm just days away from getting a new article uh, published in the Naval War College Review again. And I apologize, you know, I, I would have loved to have had it published in Naval History, but frankly, this is about 6,000 words worth of scholarship, and that's not the kind of format that, that is applicable for your, for your fine magazine. Um, but I'm talking about the misunderstood role of Point Luck in the battle. Point Luck is where Nimitz positions his aircraft carriers off to the northeast of Midway, uh, to open the battle. And what people don't appreciate is that the original incarnation of the battle plan has the American carriers sitting 360 nautical miles away from where the Japanese are supposed to show up. And well, what does that mean? It, it means that um, even if the Japanese are detected in the morning, the American carriers would have had to have steamed probably six to eight hours. There wouldn't have been any strike uh, until it, you know, mid-afternoon at the earliest, likely what that ends up creating is a multi-day affair, which is completely different from the historical shape of the real battle. What was going on there, I think, is that Nimitz is hedging his bets. He wants to put his carriers in a position where they can intercede on the second day of the battle if it looks like things are going well. But he also wants to give his carrier commanders the opportunity that if things are not going well, they can disengage cleanly and get the heck out of Dodge without even ever being sighted. So that's an important clarification to the record. I don't think it's been understood literally for 80 years. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Look for that, folks. The June Naval War College Review. Yeah. Spring issue. It should be coming out in like a week or so. Great. We'll look for that. That sounds good. And you're right. 6,000 words would have broken our uh, bank. <laughs> really. Yeah. Real estate yeah. played in our magazine, unfortunately, but uh, I look forward to reading that. Yeah. I have to say, we got a couple more questions here. We better get um, Let's pop them up here on the screen. Um, okay. What was reported in the U.S. media about 
carrier losses following Coral Sea. Right. Um, geez, I don't know the answer to this question right off the top of my head. When we officially announced the sinking of Lexington, I do want to say that it was reasonably proximate to the battle, um, but we didn't talk anything about Yorktown, of course. You're quite right. The questioner is quite right uh, in saying that the Japanese did think that they had sunk both Lexington and Yorktown, and therefore, uh, for this operation against Midway, they should only be up against two American carriers, Max, Hornet, and um, Enterprise. That, in turn, influences Japan's decision that, okay, well, just because Shokaku and Zuikaku get kind of dinged up down in Coral Sea, I've still got four aircraft carriers. The Americans have only got two, so I feel comfortable going and fighting that battle. Um, we certainly were very, very um, keeping the cards close to our chest regarding Yorktown's status. And honestly, we didn't really know Yorktown's status until she docks on May 27th. Uh, and they have a chance to haul her into the dry dock the following morning and make an assessment of what's, you know, what they can repair in those 48 hours. So a good question. Yeah, thank you, Christopher Rowe. I think that's your second one. Thanks for engaging. We really love it. Uh, okay, we got another one here. This one's about the Japanese Navy. Is it true the Japanese Navy didn't allow the surviving sailors to go home to keep the results of the battle away from the public and sent them away, far away, to Japanese bases? It is absolutely true. Uh, and in fact, you can mark uh, the Battle of Midway as sort of the beginning of a concerted campaign on the part of the Japanese authorities to keep the lid on any bad news that's coming out of the war. Um, and this cover-up was um, authorized by Hirohito specifically, you know, who, who goes so far as to say, I'll issue uh, an imperial rescript, which is, you know, a, a, a big deal in Japan when the emperor deigns to issue a rescript commemorating this glorious victory that our naval forces have just won. So the emperor is willing to lie on behalf of this, of this cover-up job. Meanwhile, uh, yeah, the wounded sailors from those carriers are being sequestered in special isolated military hospitals, and they are not allowed to see family members or anything of the sort. Um, a lot of the unwounded survivors do end up finding themselves shipped off to remote outposts down in the South Pacific. Uh, a lot of the aviators, of course, are going to end up being attached to other carriers and are going to find themselves, um, you know, going to their deaths in the carrier battles uh, later on in, in 1942. For instance, uh, Commander Murata, who was the torpedo squadron uh, commander on Akagi. He's the leader of the torpedo attack against Battleship Row at Pearl Harbor. He's going to die in the Battle of Santa Cruz in October of 1942. So as much as possible, the Japanese tried to, you know, just get all these guys out of Japan and send them to places where even if they did talk, uh, word was not going to get back to the, the general public. It had to have been a shock to the Japanese psyche, the uh, outcome of this battle. No question about it. They went in there to deliver a death blow. Right. And it uh, blew up in their faces, quite literally. Yeah. And it would never be the same. Yeah. Well, our guest today has been Jonathan Parshall, uh, co-author of Shattered Sword, a um, modern-day classic of the Battle of Midway. It's been an honor to have you with us, John, on this 80th anniversary of the wind-up of the battle. And uh, we look forward to um, having more from you in the magazine going forward. As you mentioned, this is an enduring topic. Yeah. Uh, and we'll never stop being interested in it here at Naval History. And uh, I feel our readers are the same. Um, and the fact that uh, we keep learning more about this is another perfect example of how history is not ever finished. Yeah. And thank you for joining us, John. Really appreciate it. And I want to thank you all for joining us as well and for the questions. Uh, those are very well, much welcome. And we love having the conversation with you as you watch because that's part of the whole thing of what we do at the Institute, which is uh, we're in the business of discussing things like this. And you really want to be a part of the discussion. You should join if you're not a member yet. And there's where you go to to join right below me on the screen there. Um, 
access to great archives that are here at the Institute and um, the lively ongoing debate that we have um, carried on for the fleet and for the public at large load these many years, almost 150. So thanks, um, everyone, and uh, we'll see you here next time for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, and it's been a pleasure, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care.